can you give a little bit of background context just so for those who aren't aware, people can get a sense of your sort of life experience background? What, do you, what have you been spending the past decades doing? <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm a uh, professor of neurosurgery at the um, uh, Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. Uh, it's on Long Island. Um, I went to medical school at uh, Columbia University in Manhattan. Um, I did my neurosurgical training at the University of Miami. Um, and I've been at uh, Stony Brook since 1991. Uh, I'm a professor of neurosurgery, as I mentioned. I do a lot of research on brain blood flow and spinal fluid uh, flow inside the brain. Um, and I have um, a, a very strong interest in um, philosophy of mind, uh, in philosophy of science. Uh, and I'm a Christian, I'm Catholic. Uh, and um, I believe that faith and reason are one thing. There's only one truth. Uh, and um, I think the best science and the best way to understand the, the mind and, and, and the brain is from a Christian perspective. I began to look a little more critically at materialism in um, uh, neuroscience, uh, the materialist understanding of the mind. The understanding that I had had was that the brain explains the mind completely. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's a um, neurosurgeon uh, and a neuroscientist named Wilder Penfield who worked back in the middle of the 20th century. And Penfield had actually said that that was the fundamental question that he asked in his career was, does the brain explain the mind completely? And he started out like I did as a materialist, believing that it did. And over his career, he came to see very clear evidence that the brain does not explain the mind completely. The, the brain plays an important role in the mind, but there's aspects of the mind that are not in the brain. And I found that the way of understanding the human soul that began with Aristotle and, um, uh, and St. Augustine, and I think culminated in St. Thomas Aquinas, really was the best way to understand the mind and the, and the brain, that, that we do have souls. Uh, and it actually fits the neuroscience very well. A, a viewer of this channel, there's a certain percentage that, that will want to kind of reduce everything down to a material explanation. Like everything ends up being physics and chemistry. Everything ends up being atomic in nature. And if you wouldn't mind from, you know, just to distill some of the main lines of evidence from your book, what, what would be certain things that you've come across during your career and during your research that you see as pointing away from that total materialistic explanation um, of what a human being is? Like what, what are some of these kind of major theses that you're putting forward in the book? Sure. Well, th there, are, there are several lines of evidence, I think. Um, in fact, you might say there are three. One is, is just logic, and there are all sorts of logical reasons uh, that, that classical philosophers, who I think were quite right, uh, have put forth as reasons why the, 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 the soul cannot strictly be a physical thing, like from the body. Um, there are also just my anecdotal experience. And there's, there's hard neuroscience. There, there's a ton of neuroscience evidence that supports the view that the soul is real and that uh, the uh, mind is not explained entirely by, by the brain. Um, I think that probably the best way to start is just with my kind of anecdotal experience. And it, it is anecdotal, but there's a, there's yeah. a lot of it. Um, what, what I noticed um, early in my career was that um, I had a lot of patients who had brains that were quite deficient. Uh, you do a CAT scan or an MRI and they're missing parts of their brains or all kinds of issues. And of course, some people were quite disabled with that, but not everybody. There were patients who were missing a lot of their brain who really were perfectly all right. <coughs> um, one particularly striking patient uh, was a young lady. Uh, we have a picture of her MRI in the book. Uh, and about two thirds of, of of her brain was missing and just replaced by fluid, and we knew this when she was born because we had seen it on the prenatal ultrasounds. And I counseled her family that you know the future didn't look too bright for her. Even at that point, I realized that there's some ambiguity here, so I didn't say she was definitely going to be profoundly disabled, but I suspected she would be. And as she's grown up, she's a perfectly normal person. She's she's in her mid twenties mm. now. She's a delightful, intelligent young uh, young lady. If you were to meet her, you know she's perfect perfectly normal person. She's missing probably two thirds of her brain. Um, I have a number wow. of patients who have, this, who have the same thing. I have, I have a, a young lady who's now in her, uh, she's about 30, um, 
is missing a good deal of the back part of her brain uh, and has fluid in there, um, who is a gifted uh, student in school. Uh, she's a published musician. Uh, she has a master's degree in English literature. She's, uh, she, uh, she's brilliant. Um, I have another young man who um, is missing about half his brain, uh, who um, has just graduated from high school, uh, and he's a, he's a he's a normal normal kid, you know, per perfectly normal kid. He loves sports. He's just like you and me. Virtually all the materialist theories say that consciousness comes from interactions between neurons within the brain cortex on the surface of the brain. And these people don't have a brain cortex. There's also, I have patients who have a condition called hydrancephaly, uh, which is a condition where um, when they were in their mother's womb, they had strokes that destroyed both of their brain hemispheres. So the only part of the brain that they have is a little tiny uh, bit of, of, is part of their brain stem. Uh, and they're quite mm. handicapped, but they're fully conscious people. Uh, they, they, they smile, they laugh, uh, they're awake, they, they sleep. Um, and virtually all of the materialist theories of how the mind relates to the brain um, uh, propose that the mind is the interaction of neurons in the cerebral cortex on the surface of the brain. But there are people who are conscious who don't have a cerebral cortex and who don't even have brain hemispheres, and they're still conscious. So the, the materialist mm -hmm. theories just don't add up. They just don't make sense. Um, and um, the uh, a kind of a seminal moment for me and my understanding of this um, was um, uh, many years ago, I was doing an operation on a woman who had a brain tumor in her left frontal lobe. And we had to do a, uh, awake surgery, meaning that she had to be awake while I was operating on her because I had to map the surface of her brain and find out where her speech area was so I didn't inadvertently damage it as I was taking out the tumor. And you can do that with local anesthesia so people don't feel pain. So um, I had a conversation with her as I was taking out the tumor, which is involving a lot of her left frontal lobe. So I was taking out a major part of her brain as I was talking to her. And she was perfectly normal. We talked about the weather. We talked about her family, about the, 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 the cafeteria food, all that stuff. And she was fine. You know, the operation took three or four hours. And at the end of the surgery, she was perfectly normal. And I thought as I left the, op the operating room is that none of my neurosurgery textbooks that often took a materialist perspective on things predicted mm. this or, or explained this. I mean, how can you be talking to somebody when you're taking out a major part of the brain that supposedly is involved in their ability to think? So I, I got looking at the scientific evidence. I, I went to the scientific literature and began reading about the mind-brain relationship um, and found a lot of interesting stuff. Now, if someone were to look at that and, you know, because another example that's coming to my mind is the classic Phineas Gage example where right, he gets the right. railroad spike that goes through. But if sure. I recall that story correctly, it's basically like the part of his brain that wasn't initially responsible for certain things ends up learning how to do the things that the part of the brain that was damaged had done prior, I guess it's suggesting mobility <clears throat> or, or the ability of, of like brain tissue to take on different roles or something. I mean, I, I probably sound so stupid as I'm yeah. saying this to you. No, but no, no, that's, is that's, that's fine. Something... I mean, right. The, the, the argument that, that, that other parts of the brain take over responsibilities when part of the brain is damaged, um, first of all, there, it's a very common argument. I mean, it's a, that's generally how neuroscientists try to explain things like this. Uh, the problem is that, number one, there's very little actual evidence for it. I mean, it, 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 it's okay, so what's the evidence? Uh, uh, we, we, we just presume that. So it's kind of hand mm. um, The uh, The other thing is that um, uh, in the case of Phineas Gage, um, his story isn't really uh, all that accurate that you read in, in books and in the popular press. Um, he, as, as I, I think you're aware, there was an, he was, this was the mid, uh, mid 19th century. He was like, I think he was a, he was a, a worker, I believe, working on, uh, on a railway. And there was an explosion mm -hmm. that drove a, a, a metal bar through his, uh, through his left eye and went up and came out his frontal lobe. Um, and so he had brain damage, but of course, millions of people have had brain damage and he recovered from it remarkably. Um, 
before the accident, he had been, uh, been a very devout man. He went to church, all that stuff. After the accident, he was a little more libertine. Um, uh, he, he did, his personality didn't change all that dramatically. I mean, he was just maybe a little bit uh, looser in his morals. Um, so the change wasn't as dramatic as it's, as it's often portrayed. Um, there is no question in neuroscience that emotions and our kind of emotional tone um, comes largely from our brain. I mean, that's 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 very clear. Um, and you and we we know that from you know if you have a few drinks, you know, you're you emotionally you're a little different than if you didn't have drinks. You know, so there, there's no question that causing um, changes in the brain, either from alcohol or from an iron spike going through your frontal lobe, can change your personality somewhat. Um, that doesn't mean that everything in your mind comes from your brain. You know, the, the, everything in your mind coming from your brain is a, is a separate statement and is a statement for which there is no evidence to support it in, in uh, neuroscience. So we always knew that if, if a person gets some brain damage, their personality can change. That doesn't mean that everything in your mind is from, is 